May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. I think it's our job to um, spread joy. I, I think that as Christians, there should be no one more joyful than a Christian because we have the hope and peace of Christ. I don't know many people who want to be around a grumpy Christian. Um, and I think that we are called to, to share our, our love for Christ and we need to be joyful in that. We celebrate because we know where we are going to live eternally. I think that that's, that's the greatest thing for us, surrounded by pe other people who love Him and, and you know are celebrating along with us. And it's just going to be one joyful, wonderful, never-ending party. <laughs>
And while he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Then they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they stayed continually at the temple praising God. When Jesus ascended and went back to heaven, they actually rejoiced and they praised God. They worshiped. They recognized that something very significant was going on here. This was a big deal that Jesus ascended. He went back to his rightful place to sit at the right hand of the Father to rule and reign over all the universe. So when Jesus was born, he was born in a physical body. It was a bodily birth, a bodily incarnation. When Jesus walked on this earth, he left footprints in the ground. He was a real physical person. When Jesus died on the cross, he died physically, and he felt the same pain you or I would have felt had we been crucified because he was doing it for us. When Jesus died and he stopped breathing, his body died. When he was buried in the tomb, he was bodily in the tomb. When he rose, it was a bodily resurrection. And when he ascended to heaven, it was his glorified body that ascended and went back to heaven. We have to understand the significance, the importance of the ascension. Years ago, when I lived, I lived and pastored in Michigan, there was a guy who was kind of in the area that I was pastoring. He was a guy who had been preaching the Bible for many years. He was actually a scholar and a professor and a pastor and teacher, but he had actually wandered off the road theologically. He had lost his biblical bearings, and he became what the ancient people called a heretic. He was teaching false teaching, but still going around to churches and preaching, and I actually ended up having a conflict with him, a conflict that lasted for about six months, because this guy was way out of line, and he was misleading people. He made statements like this, and this statement he made in a local newspaper, and he made from the pulpit of a church. Here's what, and I want you to listen to this. He said, if they found the bones of Jesus tomorrow... That would not affect my faith one bit. If they found the bones of Jesus tomorrow, it wouldn't affect my faith. If they found the bones of Jesus tomorrow, guess what? Jesus didn't rise from the dead. He was still in the tomb. If they found the bones of Jesus tomorrow, Jesus didn't ascend back to heaven. If they found the bones of Jesus tomorrow, it wouldn't just kind of affect my faith. I'd be done being a pastor. Because we believe in a risen Savior. Someone say Amen. We believe he rose again from the dead bodily and ascended to heaven. It matters. Now look with me at Luke chapter 1. I'm sorry, not Luke chapter 1, Acts chapter 1. Luke wrote the book of Acts, and so this is kind of, kind of Luke part 2. The book of Acts is kind of Luke's Holy Spirit-inspired teaching in the book of Acts. So Luke begins Acts chapter 1 with these words. In my former book, that means the Gospel of Luke, in my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach. Now look at verse 2. Until the day he was taken up to heaven. That's the ascension. That's what we're celebrating today. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, after his crucifixion, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. Now this is the resurrected Jesus. So he's talking about how Jesus showed up to all these different people. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. Those are the passages we've been studying over these weeks. Verse 4. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, that's John the Baptist, baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Next Sunday is Pentecost Sunday. We're going to talk about how Jesus ascended to heaven and then he sent the Holy Spirit down to be with us. We're going to talk about the Holy Spirit next Sunday. You'll want to be here for that. Verse 6. They gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? So now Christ, Christ has risen from the dead. He's taught them. He's about to ascend to heaven. And they said, let's talk politics. Do we get to be in charge again? The Romans had come in with power and they had the authority. Do we get to be in charge again? Does our team get to be you know, the one who tells people what to do? And they gather around him and they said, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Well, he was establishing a kingdom in heaven, Amen. He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. He said, I'm not going to answer that for you. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, right where you live, all Judea, the surrounding communities, Samaria, the places you try to avoid, the tough places, and to the ends of the earth. He says, what matters is that when I go away, I'm going to send my spirit to be with you. And I have a mission for you. I have a plan for you. And then verse 9. After this, after Jesus said this, he was taken up before their eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. So Jesus ascends to heaven, disappears into the clouds. Verse 10, they were looking intently up into the sky as he was going. 
when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? They're staring up as Jesus disappears in the clouds. Why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. What's going on? Yeah, amen. So he's going to come again. Please feel free to respond. Exactly. He says he's going to come back the way he went. So what's happening in the ascension of Jesus? This is the assurance that the victory is won. This is the celebration. See, we celebrate Christmas. We celebrate Easter. Jesus came. Jesus rose. We don't usually celebrate the ascension. We should. It's a big deal. We're going to look at what it means that Christ ascended. We're going to dig into the scriptures and see what it means. But Jesus ascended to heaven. He won the victory. And so I want you to think for a minute. And I, I know everyone's wired differently. And whether you're at home or in, in, in the courtyard or family worship venue or here in the worship center, I want you to think when you get really excited, when you see a victory, maybe, maybe you're a, a huge fan of this team or that team or this sport or watching a child or grandchild or a friend or, or you know, when something really good happens and you want to celebrate, how do you respond? Is, 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 okay, thank you. You're jumping into it. Yes. Okay. So we're going to, so here's what I'm going to, I want you to think in your mind, how do you respond? Like what is your biggest, best response? Because just, in just a minute, I'm going to actually actually do that. If you're home alone, your neighbors might think you're crazy, but you can jump out of your seat. And, but I'm, wherever you are, I'm going to ask you, when I tell you just a moment, I'm going to ask you to actually respond like you would respond if your favorite sports team won the World Series or the NFL Championship or a golf, you know, like if you were watching and like your favorite person, your favorite sports person wins and, and you go, oh, that's lovely. <laughs> just lovely. Is that, is that it? Is that how you respond or do you give it more than that? If you get like a, a great raise or a new job, you've been praying for a job and you get a new job, you kind of go, oh, that's nice. And you go, yeah, yeah. You know, what's your... So in just a moment, I'm going to ask you to, get to, to do your best response. When I get really excited, one of the things I do is I whistle. So I'm going to turn my mic off for a second because my whistle is kind of loud. This is one of my things. I'll do this. That's with my mic off. Um, and so, so here's, I'm going to go three, two, one, and I'm going to say celebrate. And I'm going to ask you to actually celebrate like you would. Some of you are like, I'm in church. <laughs> this is not how I behave. Now, some of you, when you get really excited, you actually just kind of go, you know, that you, but I want you to, like, you know how you respond. I want your best response. I'm going to three, two, one, go. And I want you, so we're going to see how this goes. Okay, here we go. Three, two, one, go. Yeah. All right, all right. Okay. I, I got to say, I never try to compare second service to first service. So keep this between you and us, but... Um, <laughs> okay. Um, so, and, and, and so for, for a sports team, we can excite, but, but for Jesus, we, kinda, we can kind of be, be neutral or kind of, uh, we're not very expressive. And so I want you to think about uh, in, in, in different situations. And, and I was thinking about this. I was trying to picture, when I read the Bible, I, you know me as a pastor. I like to use props. And this. I, think, I think in terms of pictures, right? I think in terms of, of, of images and pictures. And so in my mind, when I, when I see Jesus ascending, I don't see it like, the children's storybook, Bible book stuff. I didn't grow up in the church, but my three boys did grow up in the church. So I get to you know, watch them. And we, they had Sunday school and class. And, the, and I think the pictures in the story Bibles and this kind of stuff of Jesus ascending gets the picture of sort of a slow motion. Jesus ascended, and kind of like Jesus in sort of a, a Jesus dress, kind of like the long flowing gown kind of thing, slowly kind of floating up into heaven and just kind of you know, doing the parade way. I'm not sure, just, that, that's kind of the, the picture. It doesn't say in the Bible how fast he ascended. It just says he ascended and disappeared in the clouds. I personally picture Jesus more like a Neo from the Matrix. Um, if you don't get the reference, that's okay. But imagine like a superhero type person going, and like the ground, and like the, the dust goes out and all the disciples' hair gets blown back and they're like, whoa. I mean, that's, that's, and, and since it doesn't say how fast, that's how I'm going to imagine it, okay? I'm just going to imagine it my way. Because when it says he returns in the way he came, I actually just going to go, boom, it hits the ground like the superhero landing, but like everything. I mean, that's, that's, it doesn't say how fast he's going to return either. So I'm not going to go the slow-mo, flowing Jesus dress thing. I'm going to go a little more superhero Jesus, personally, in my mind. Um, but, but in a sense, and, and I, I think of it like this. There's a term called a mic drop. You know what a mic drop is? When somebody, like, they finish their song, do their thing, they're like, they give them their speech, they're done. It's like, like Jesus is like, he left the glory of heaven. He came as one of us. He lived a perfect life. He died on the cross for our sins, in our place, conquering sin, death, hell, and the enemy. Amen. All right? He, he, they buried him, but he rose again. He, he then goes around and teaches and preaches and restores people, and he's done. I mean, he who left the glory of heaven and came to earth is now going to ascend back to heaven. And the ascension is like Jesus going, 
done, boom, out of here, boom. That's, that's how I see it. And for those of you that are worried about the microphone and church budget, I contacted Dale and said, Dale, do you have an old broken microphone? He said, I happen to have saved one in a drawer. A little Holy Spirit through Dale, our tech guys, said, I got it. So it's broken already. Don't worry about it. Uh, but I want you to think for a minute how people respond in big moments. Sports, I watch, I watch people who watch sports. And I notice that I watch them as they watch sports and I watch them as they worship Jesus. And which of those two things bring out the most excitement in them? Oftentimes, it's sports. So I, I was thinking about this. I, I, I was thinking about watching Christ. And I was going to show you a couple of clips of things. But, but our team told me if I showed clips of things that are off of YouTube or from somewhere else, in the middle of our, all of our people at home, which is a couple thousand people um, who are online, they'll shut us down in the middle of the sermon if they pick up that we're using clips that someone else owns. So we're being careful if I can use pictures. So I want you to imagine in the 2005 Masters, some of you have seen this golf shot. Tiger, who went on, Tiger Woods, who went on to win the Masters in 2005, he had a shot at number 16 at, the, at Augusta National that went over the green, an impossible chip shot. If you don't know golf, just stay with me. He's got to hit this little white, white ball into a hole. And it's like, and, and he has to actually, he, he's, the ball's over here. He walks up on the green and he looks it over and he's looking about 25 feet left of the hole because the whole green slopes like this. And he's looking at the shot and, and they're just going, there's no way he can get it even close to the hole. Really. But he goes back to his shot, gets ready. He makes the shot. It's like, it's like almost in slow motion. It goes up there, and it goes up about 20 feet above the hole. And it kind of pauses and slowly turns, like a 90-degree turn, and the ball starts rolling down slowly, 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 rolling. And, and, then, and then the commentators, it's like, have you ever? It's like it's getting, it's getting all excited. And, it, and the ball rolls, and it gets like a foot from the hole, three inches from the hole. It stops about a sixteenth of an inch from the hole and just pauses. Just enough time for it to pause, and the Nike symbol to show up like it's a commercial for Nike. <laughs> and it pauses, and then it just kind of falls in the hole. And this is Tiger's response at that moment. He goes nuts. But here's what I want you to notice. Look at the people behind Tiger. What are they doing? Are they just sitting there going, they're going nuts. Look at all the hands in the air. And there's, they, they're on there. Some of them are just sitting. But you know, the, the place just erupts. I wish you could see the video. And you probably, some of you will watch it not during the sermon, but on YouTube later. Um, but the place goes nuts. Why? It's a response to the victory. When Christ ascends back to heaven... It's just, there's just this, this heavenly and this earthly celebration. He had finished the work. He was done. He's going back to his rightful place. He who left the glory of heaven was returning to glory. And heaven goes nuts, and we should too. That's the reality. And so, so there's that. Now, I'll give you another sports illustration. 2012, San Francisco Giants. Fourth game of the World Series. They won the first three. They're in Detroit. And the final pitch, boom, strikeout. And they go nuts. And everyone in the stadium who's cheering for the Giants goes nuts. Tigers fans, not so much. But, uh, but you can look at the response and you go, why so? I mean, they won. So it's like the resurrection. Okay, they won. It's over, right? So what's the big deal? No, there's a response afterwards. There's an excitement about the victory, about the win, about what's happened. Or I want you to imagine, and I'll show you a picture in just a moment, not quite yet. I want you to imagine the Warriors. It's a basketball team, if you didn't know. Uh, and a victor, I'm gonna, in a minute, I'm going to show you a picture, and I want you to, in your mind to decide what year is this. Is this year, this picture, in 1947, their first championship? 1956, 1975, 2015, 2017, 2018, or 2022? Predictive. We'll see what happens. Um, but but here, here's the response. Okay, they're, they're, after they won, well, shouldn't people just, okay, we're done, and kind of calmly walked out? No, they want to stick around. Why? To celebrate. To, to rejoice in the victory. And so when Jesus ascends to heaven, it's better than a chip-in. It's better than a great baseball series. It's better than another world championship. And Christ's people should go nuts. So I'm going to give you one more try. In a moment, I'm going to declare a line. The line I'm going to declare is, he has ascended. On Easter, you know, pastors will say, he has risen. And people say, he has risen indeed. I'm going to say, he has ascended. I want you to respond with your best celebration cheer if you will. Three, two, one. He has ascended. Oh. Yes. All right. All right. I like it. I could say let's close in, I could say let's close in prayer, but I got more preaching to do. So, so what does it mean? What, and maybe for some of you, you're like, I've celebrated Easter, I've celebrated Christmas. I never really celebrated Ascension Sunday. I never heard of it before. 
okay? If that's you, I wanna tell you why we celebrate his ascension, okay? So I'm gonna give you some becauses, all right? Because he ascended, he rules and reigns in glory. Because Jesus ascended, he is on the throne. Is there, does anyone here need to know that God's on the throne today? I mean, we need to know in our crazy world, with the violence, with the division, with the confusion, with all that goes on, we have to remember when he ascended, he rules, he reigns, he is over all. The last couple of years I've been thinking about and kind of meditating on the opening chapters of the book of Revelation. I do, daily, I do my daily Bible study, but almost every day I try to just, just spend my mind, just kind of direct my mind to these opening chapters of Revelation and let it become part of my heart. And in Revelation chapter one, beginning of verse 12, John, who has, has had this vision of Jesus, gives us kind of his first picture of what he's seen. This is a picture of the risen, ascended Jesus Christ in glory. And I always say with the book of Revelation, you're meant to almost see it more than hear it. So as you listen to these words, try try to picture this in your mind, all right? John writes these words. He says, I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, and with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars, and coming out of his mouth was a sharp, double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. And John says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. And then he placed his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead and now look, I am alive forever and ever and I hold the keys of death and hell. That's our risen Jesus. That's our ascended Jesus, amen? Amen. That's Jesus, and, and he, he rules, he reigns, and we need to know this. We need to understand that he is on the throne when times are tough, and for many of you, you're facing that right now. I got a letter from a buddy of mine who, who's a pastor in, in, the, in the country of Sri Lanka. His name is Ajith Fernando. He's a scholar, he's an author, and he's a local church pastor, and he mostly through his whole life has worked with high school kids, trying to help them move away from the world and move towards Jesus. And Ajith wrote me a letter this last week, and it just gave me perspective. Because I, I, there's times where I look and go, I look at how bad things are, and I think, okay, can things get any worse? And when he wrote this letter, he said, he said to this group of people, it's kind of a prayer group he has, he said, will you pray for me and for the people of Sri Lanka, for the Christians in particular? He said, right now, when we need gas for our cars or fuel, propane for our homes, we have to go and wait in line for eight to 10 hours. And oftentimes, you'll wait for eight, or t- eight to 10 hours, and then they'll tell you they've run out, and you, and you go home with nothing. I thought there's some perspective as I'm you know, looking at what I'm facing, going, man, that's, that's pretty serious stuff. He said that they've, so, they've, so, they've overprinted the, 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 their currency, that right now, he said, their currency is worth almost nothing, and, and, and the inflation is high, currency is worth almost nothing, and, and their whole economy is falling apart. He's saying there's, there's civil unrest. In the place that he lives, uh, proselytizing, sharing the gospel is against the law in many places. You can be taken as a Christian or a Christian pastor and thrown in jail for no reason and left there for as long as they want to leave you there and no one explains why. And I thought, and as he wrote this, he just wrote it for prayer, but for me, it did something in my soul. It made me look and say, you know, I'm still pretty free and yeah, I, I, gas may have gone up in price, but I can get gas. And it just sometimes, and, and I'm, not say, I'm not belittling anything that we're going through. I'm just saying, man, man when, when times are tough, but here's one of the things I love about Ajith and about his wife, Nellen, is that, is that we, and we've been kind of prayer partners for 25 years now. And one of the things I love about them and their ministry is that in all that they go through, which is way more than I've ever gone through as a pastor, they always know that God is on the throne and their faith doesn't waver. And that gives me hope and encouragement just in case things get worse where I live and where I am to know that you can stand strong no matter what you face. Because he ascended, He is exalted and worshiped. Because Christ has ascended, we can worship him anytime, any place, because his bones aren't in the ground. He he is bodily risen, bodily ascended, and he he is glorified in heaven, so he can be exalted and worshiped. Listen to these words again from Luke 24. I read these earlier, but listen to them again. 
While Jesus was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. And we'll look at the response, the first response. Then they worshiped him. When he ascended, what was the first thing they did? They worshiped. They gave him praise and glory. They returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they stayed continually at the temple praising God. They, they rejoiced. They worshiped. Never take for granted the privilege of worship. Whether you're at home alone right now or at home with friends and family, whether you're in the courtyard or family worship venue in the worship center, when we have a chance to worship God, it is an honor. It is a privilege. The ascended Lord Jesus deserves our praise and worship, and it should come flowing out of us. Take advantage of any chance you have to worship and glorify him, and remember to worship and praise him even when times are tough, even when times are difficult. In the book of Philippians, the apostle Paul writes that there will come a day when every knee will bow in heaven and earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There will come a day where every knee will bow. We just choose to bow down and worship by our own volition, amen? We choose to worship him. We choose to praise him and glorify him. Because he ascended, he is interceding for us. Because Jesus ascended to heaven, right now he is praying for you. He is interceding for you. He is calling out to the Father on your behalf. Romans 8, 34 says this. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. This means if you're in Christ, no one can really condemn you. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life and is at the right hand of God, who's ascended to the right hand of the Father and is also interceding for us. Jesus is looking out for you. His eye is on you. He's interceding for you all the time. And, and you might pause and say, well, you know, I've had tough stuff happen in my life and I wish Jesus would have stopped that from happening. I, don't, I can't explain to you how all that works. But I, have a, I live with a deep sense that there will come a day when I'll stand before Jesus and he will show me all the ways he protected me through my life. Yeah, tough things have happened in my life. I, I don't understand why my firstborn son, when the first time his wife was pregnant, you know, lost the child and then lost the next one and lost the next one and lost the next one and then battled with infertility. I can't explain that to you. I can't say, oh, let me, let me wrap it up with a tidy bow. And it, there's things in life that are really hard that have hit your life, my life, all of our lives. But in the, midst, in the midst of all of that, he is watching out for us. He's interceding. He's protecting. And I think, you, I, I think that there's gonna, when I see Jesus face to face, we, you know, we might spend the first four years of eternity with him just showing me all the ways that he protects, I mean, the dumb things I've done through my childhood, through my middle school years, my high school years, even after I became a Christian. I think there's been times that God has protected me that I never even recognized. He is watching out for you and you can live. He's ascended and he's right now, he's interceding on your behalf. Because he ascended, he will come again. Because he ascended, he will come, he will come a second time. Listen to these words from Acts chapter 11. I read it earlier, but listen to this. Think about his, his return. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? Because Jesus just ascended into the clouds. They're standing and looking. It says, says, the same Jesus who's been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. He is coming again. Because he ascended, he will descend again in a glorious second coming, and then he will make all things right. There's a lot of injustice and bad stuff in our world. Little secret for you. There always has been. We just have news that flows all day long that points out all the bad things in the world. But we live in a broken world with broken, sinful people, and the enemy is at work. There's real sp spiritual battles going on. But there will come a day when Jesus comes again where he will make everything right. Because he ascended, he will one day descend and come again. Because he ascended... And this is important. We can live in humble obedience because Christ ascended and sent his Holy Spirit to be with us and in us. And we're gonna study the Holy Spirit next week on, 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 uh, on um, I'm trying to blank it, Pentecost, Pentecost Sunday. Next week is, is in, in the church here. It's, called, it's, it's when the Spirit came in power. So because Jesus ascended, we can, we can now walk in humble obedience. Listen to these words from Titus chapter two, verses 12 and 13. It teaches us to say, no, to ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live life self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. We can live for Jesus in this life while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. As we await the second coming of Jesus, whenever that's gonna happen, and by the way, I don't try to predict or figure it out. I leave that up to Jesus, okay? 
I will never write a book about when Jesus is gonna return again, except for I know it's gonna be very soon. How do I know that? Because Jesus said that 2,000 years ago. So, um, but, so, so I'm not gonna make predictions, but I will tell you this, that while we're awaiting the second coming of Jesus, we can live for him because the spirit is in us and he leads us. We don't, have to, we don't have to be resigned to the fact that, oh, the world's messed up, so I'm going to be messed up. But to say, I can learn day by day with humility and the power of the Spirit to live for Jesus and to walk in humble obedience. And then, because he ascended, we can walk in great joy. We can have joy even in times of pain. In Acts chapter 16, where it talks about the Apostle Paul has been beaten and basically, and basically tortured publicly, locked in jail, and while he and Silas and others are locked in jail, with joy, they're singing glory and praise to God. We can have joy even in hard times. And actually what comes from their, their prayers and their praise and, and their willingness to be obedient to God is, is, is that they're set free, but the jailer comes in and is gonna kill himself because he thinks he's lost his prisoners. In the ancient world, if a Roman jailer lost their prisoners, they were killed. So this jailer just thought, well, I'm gonna do what's gonna happen to me anyways. I'm gonna kill myself. Paul from inside the jail says, we didn't leave. We're still here. All the doors have been opened from an earthquake and through God's hand. And, this, and Paul gets to preach the gospel to this jailer and his family, and they put their faith in Jesus. But I believe it started with Paul and Silas and others in jail, sore and aching, but still filled with joy. The point wasn't that they didn't have pain for what they were facing. The point was in their pain, they still had joy. Why? Because they still had Jesus. He was there with them in that moment. And so you read again in Luke chapter 24. While he was blessing them, Jesus left them and was taken up to heaven. Then they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they stayed continually in the temple praising God. Why would they be rejoicing? Jesus was leaving. And they shouldn't be rejoicing, but Jesus had told them before, it's better for you that I go away because when I go away, I will send my spirit to be with you and in you. And then he says, I will be with you. See, the spirit of God is the spirit of Jesus. So he said, right now you have with me, you with me physically, but when I ascend to heaven, I'm gonna send my spirit to be in every one of you. Again, we're gonna lean into that next Sunday, the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. And then because he ascended, we are never alone. Because Jesus ascended, he, he died on the cross, he paid for our sins, he was placed in the tomb, he rose again, he taught people and for 40 days interacted with people, but then he ascended to heaven. And because he ascended, we're never alone. He's gonna be with us. Listen to these words from Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20. This is Matthew's kind of final words of Jesus, portion of his gospel. And, and, and he writes, inspired by the Holy Spirit, he says, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the, in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them, teaching these new believers to obey everything I've commanded you. And then listen to this. And surely Jesus says, I am with you always to the very end of the age. He's about to ascend, and he says, oh, and by the way, I'm with you always. Why? Because the Spirit dwells in us. If you understand the ascension of Jesus, you understand if you're a Christian, you are never alone. Because the Spirit of God, when you came to the cross and received the grace of Jesus and confessed your sins and took his hand to follow him, he moved into your life by his Spirit. He moved into you, and he will never leave. So when you have no one else around you and when you feel lonely, you're not alone. Not if you're a Christian. I remember as a young believer, I, all my friends before I became a Christian, I didn't have any friends that were Christians. So when I became a Christian, I stopped doing the stuff I was doing before. Most of the stuff I did was either stupid, dangerous, or illegal. So I stopped doing those things. And my friends didn't want to be around me. I had a whole period of time before I made new friends that a bunch of my friends just didn't want to be around me anymore because I wouldn't do what they were doing. And so I just spent a lot of time alone, but I was never alone. I remember, I remember this profoundly one day. I, I didn't have anyone to hang out with. It was, a, it was summertime. And so I just said a prayer, and I said, Jesus, um, I'm going out to skateboard. Do you want to come along? That's a prayer of a 15-year-old kid who was a brand-new Christian and who just, whose friends didn't want to be around him. And he said Yes as much as I could hear. And I went out skateboarding and spent a couple hours skateboarding with Jesus. He's pretty good. Um, <laughs> he wasn't skateboarding. He was with me in my heart. Though. But can I, can I tell you, um, I know there's people right now that say, I feel lonely. I feel discouraged. But because he's ascended, because he returned to glory, because he sent his Holy Spirit to be in you and with you, you are not alone, ever. 
In your lonesome moments, you're not alone because Jesus is with you. And if you're not a Christian and you put your faith in him, he will enter your life and be with you always. And then finally, because he ascended, we have a mission. We have a calling. Every Christian has a mission that God sends them on and a partner in that mission. Acts chapter one, verse eight, we read these words. Jesus says, before he ascends, he says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses. You'll share about me. You'll shine my light. You'll let the world know that, that I love them too. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, right where you live, in, Ju- in all Judea, your surrounding community, in Samaria, the places that are tough and hard to go to, and to the ends of the earth. Jesus says, because I've ascended, because I'm gonna go back to the Father, because I'm gonna come into your life by the Holy Spirit, You now have a purpose in your life. You have a mission. Let the world know that I love them too. And Jesus, I'm gonna be with you in that mission. He's our partner in that mission. That's amazing. That's glorious. We celebrate Christmas, and we should. Jesus came. We celebrate Easter, and we should. Jesus rose. But today, we celebrate the ascension of Jesus Christ back to heaven. So I'm gonna say it one more time. And I hope you have a good response. That's all I'm going to say. He has ascended. All right. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. So before I send you off with a blessing, I want to invite you to an amazing, incredible free event coming up right here in Monterey. This Wednesday at 615 at Shoreline Church. It's night of worship. So you're going to say, I've never done that before. It's a, it is my favorite Wednesday of the month because the whole church gathers together. Some will be online. Some will be in the courtyard outdoors. Some will be indoors here. But we gather together this Wednesday, 615. And I, the message God's put on my heart out of, out of the parables, the stories of Jesus, I really believe will speak to your heart. The worship team has a great worship time planned. We're going to have communion together. We're going to celebrate Jesus. And so I invite you to join us this Wednesday, 615. We also, at nights of worship, we have translation into Spanish. Uh, We have the the courtyard, the Jumbotron working out there. We have online and also kids programming from nursery through fifth grade. So you have little ones, get them involved in that. You come to worship and then pick them up and then we'll have refreshments afterwards and kind of have a community time together. If you need prayer, uh, don't go on, keep pressing on without getting the support you need. If you need prayer, if you're online, uh, just, just email your prayer needs. We will pray faithfully for you to the email address you see or call the phone number you see and we have people waiting right now to answer that phone and to pray with you right now. If you're anywhere on campus, we'll have teams in the front of the worship center waiting to pray for you and they love, they love praying for people. So please don't hesitate to come forward after the service. If you're outdoors or in the family worship venue, come on over here and we'll love to join you in prayer here in the worship center. And if you're new at Shoreline, if you are online, all you need to do is just text the word welcome to the phone number you see on the screen. What we'll do is we'll reach out to you in the next 24 to 48 hours. We want to just kind of have a personal connection with you. And as be- if you're somewhere else far away in the world or locally, we want to connect with you and get to know you better. If you're on campus and you're new, welcome. We're so glad you're here. Do one thing before you leave campus. Right inside the doors, right there in the, in the lobby is our Connection Center. And we have a whole team there. They'd love to give you a little gift bag and thank you for coming. They'd like to give you a warm personal welcome and answer any questions you have. So before you leave, if you're on campus, connect there. If you're online, just text the word welcome. If you're able to stand, wherever at home, on campus, stand with me and let me send you off with a word of blessing. As we go from this place, as we finish online, may God, who came among us, who lived a perfect life, Emmanuel, God with us, Jesus, who died on the cross for your sins, who was buried in the tomb, who rose again, who traveled around and spoke truth to his own people and others after he rose, and who ascended to heaven, May he be near you and fill you. May you walk in his power, in his joy, with his message, living for Jesus this day and every day. God bless you. Have a great next couple of days, and we'll see you Wednesday night, 6.15, and then next Sunday. God bless you. Have a great week.